I'm very pleased today to welcome you to a conversation between uh, Carlos Garrido Castellano and Chus Martinez. Um, born in Spain, Chus Martinez has a background in philosophy and art history. Currently, Martinez is the head of the Institute of Art of the FHNW Academy of Arts and Design in Basel, Switzerland. And from 2021 on, right now, uh, she will be the artistic director of the Ocean Space in Venice, a project initiated by the TBA 21 Academy. She's been the chief curator at El Museo del Barrio, um, New York, and she was documented 13 head of department and member of core agent group. Previously, she was chief curator at MACPA in Barcelona from 2008 to 2011, director of the Frankfurter Kunstverein in 2005 to 2008, and artistic director of Sala Recalde in Bilbao from 2002 to 2005. Uh, for the 56th uh, Venice Biennale, Martinez created the National Pavilion of Catalonia with a solo project of filmmaker Albert Serra. And for the 51st edition of the, uh, for the 51st edition, the Cyprus National Pavilion. Um, in 2014-15, she served as curatorial alliance for the Istanbul Biennial. And in 2008, served as a curatorial advisor for the Carnegie International. And in 2010, for the 29th Biennale de Sao Paulo. Chus uh, Martinez lectures and writes regularly, including numerous catalog texts and critical essays and is a regular contributor to Art Forum, among other international journals. Um, so our format for today is, um, as always, uh, we're going to uh, head over to a pre-recorded conversation between Chus and Carlos now in a couple of seconds. Um, and then we'll link back up here uh, live um, for a conversation between the two of them. Um, and you'll always have the opportunity, of course, to pose questions or make comments uh, using the chat function or the Q&A function on Zoom. But without further ado, uh, let me hand over to Carlos Grido Castellano in conversation with Chus Martinez. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining the conversation on painting series. Uh, we are very happy to have you here. Let me just start by asking you uh, what reasons uh, move you to become a curator and what were the main influences you have at the start of your career uh, as a curator professionally? No reasons. I actually <laughs> did not want to become a curator. Um, my life is a succession of avoidances. So I really wanted to avoid um, to finish my PhD at the time. I was a philosophy and um, art history student and I was predestinated because lack of funding in my family to uh, apply for funding, got the funding, which is uh, very lucky. But then I needed to do a PhD. And at the time, I thought my head was definitely empty of ideas. So I did start the PhD. I did the first round. But I thought that everything that I wrote was rubbish, bullshit, nothing. So and um, with that attitude in mind, I, I went to Columbia University and uh, my PhD was supposed to be very critical positioning against Arthur Danto. Then I met Arthur Danto. Arthur Danto was such a wonderful person. And then he said, you know what, John Levy, there is a friend of mine whose son-in-law is running this new thing called curatorial studies. You need to join that and tell us what it is. And then I, I was just sent in a mission. So I was there, you know, I was just bringing the lunch to the curatorial room. I was not supposed to stay. And I was like just um, into it. But I confess that I always wanted to have um, a practice inside a practice. So I am envious of those with a practice. And I do think that there is no better theory that the theory that can be practiced that you can actually embody. So um, probably I thought that being a curator is being closer to those that have a practice and can through the definition of um, complex notions of experience, uh, propose new ideas and, and actually articulate a new logic that later on may lead to a new thinking. So that's what kind of stick me there. But I still have problems. I, would, I, I never introduced myself as a curator. I still think that I was just bringing the lunch. <laughs> Uh, I'm also very much interested too in how you bring together education, exhibition making, and many other kind of creative practices and creative backgrounds. Uh, and I'm thinking that for, for many decades, in the context of the Spanish state, there was an, a kind of education, a kind of program, a kind of uh, academic background that allowed people to do that. 
So to what extent, how difficult it was to navigate uh, this terrain and uh, deal with an educational system uh, where, let's say, curating was a discipline per se, or a career per se? You mean, um, yeah, well, I suppose that curating should be kind of, uh, you should be attached to a curator to uh, to learn like, as you are attached to a kitchen and a chef to learn cooking. So that would be the best way of, of learning of learning it. But of course, um, it has been very uh, mediated by this thing that we call the head. So, and um, also the pocket has played a major role in understanding the role of uh, curators as kind of in between spaces of institutions. Because even if people relate, the, you talk about curators, but then which curators, institutional um, or, or freelance curators, and also these distinctions are distinctions of the past and actually were very short historical distinctions because um, many, the practice also emerge in such a substantial way because of an economic, uh, let's say, redefinition of the role of culture and museums and institutions during a certain period of the beginning of the 2000s, and this kind of stopped also. So, you know, many cities and many municipalities thought that activating culturally uh, was a demand, besides the programs that were happening already in their institution. So curators emerge also as a way of uh, mediating in between that political desire, that money that was created there, and also a very strong uh, individual perception by many young people that curating was fantastic because it was in between so many walls that it was difficult to define. And that's exactly what many people when they are young are looking for. In a, in a very positive way because they don't want to be ascribed to anything. So curating kind of allow every individual uh, to connect interests which were personal with the possibility of historical relevance with the um, importance of collections and institutional attachment and legitimation. So it was a, um, a weird combination of positive facts that made that era of curating that that era lasted for 15 minutes. I think we are not yet there. And uh, meaning we are not anymore there, not yet there. So, and, and that's why probably I did not identify. I think I felt that the current was my current because I did not want it to be ascribed to anything, but actually also not to creating. So I also did not want to become a creator. I did not want to become anything if possible. So it would be amazing to be a facilitator among many disciplines and many situations and then discover um, if there is a possibility, a slight possibility of thinking differently about the question of culture, cultural production, knowledge, knowledge production, words that I totally dislike. So it would be much better to talk otherwise, but to talk otherwise, you need to think otherwise. So I, I do think that that was my main motivation. But yeah, I think studying it, I don't know, I think it was fun, I must confess, because I was with a fun group of punk women that we became really good friends. I recommend extraordinary conditions for studying may create incredible friendships. So that's why I think study is mandatory. But, um, but I don't know if the content in itself uh, stick much to me. Uh, let me turn to your uh, work at MATBA, which is for me very interesting because it, uh, I think it avoids any labeling. It's very difficult to define and categorize each activity, each initiative, according to, as you mentioned before, specific uh, disciplines or practices. Uh, your labor at the front of MATBA also matches, matches the first years of the financial crisis, mm -hmm. the economic crisis. How was, how difficult it was, let's say, to navigate this terrain? And how much freedom and how much uh, range, let's say, did you have uh, back then? It was a very beautiful time, in a way, because I was completely green, as we say in Spanish, in working with um, institutions with that structure. So I was not mature. I never really worked with collections. 
and it's fantastic to discover if you are interested in them or not. And I discover I'm not. So I am really not a historical person and I have a really lateral interest in historicizing the past. And, and yet I'm deeply in love with things and works and artists that are in the past. But, um, but I thought it uh, complex and a fantastic exercise for me uh, to really be close to the fantastic team that was dealing with the collection, uh, to observe how the register work and the team and the many aspects that I was not um, honestly uh, very uh, yeah, familiar with. Um, I love working in team and I discovered that if teams work well and the team of Magba at the time worked very well, at least the team that was below um, direction, uh, below the director, uh, it was fantastic. It's a, it's a really, really beautiful, fertile uh, context. It's not super flexible because museums uh, work in programs. Programs are and need to be scheduled ahead. You suffer a lot by it. Uh, because and then you just commonly discover possibilities of new programs. So if, if, because we were so excited about bringing new energies into the museum, we kind of started activated the chapel, which is a parallel space that was in the same piazza as the museum. We started working with the Center of Research and Documentation, making different types of exhibition. We were completely longing for younger people at the museum. So we tried really hard as a team um, to think about new formats in the public programs. The public programs became really successful. And exactly that um, was my, my major love. So I, 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 I confess that those moments where people are in the room with the art and the artists are for me, um, without doubt, the most magical and beautiful moments. Moments of um, exhibition making is fantastic, but leaving the exhibitions there is less fantastic or is less dynamic. And um, also I discovered that I can't really not live without being all the time surrounded by artists. So it's a problem that I have and I suffer when in the museum, it's very difficult to be all the time with living artists because some of the time you need to spend um, in other activities or historical activities and, and concerns. And um, I also discovered that there is a really good possibility of activating the museum without being a populist. And this is something that, of course, I couldn't enact there. But um, let's say that when I was working on Magba, I thought a lot about it. And this thinking has been accompanying me all through these years. For example, should we do exhibitions for the object's sake or do we do exhibitions for the people? And I think that in the Western um, context and because of our imperial and colonial um, backgrounds, um, the heritage, the object, the fact that there is a something to exhibit plays a major role in our institutions. But I hope and I think there is the possibility of twisting our exhibitions or our institutions doing exhibitions, museums and collections from that moment of, let's say, heritage and history and uh, reading of the past in those canonical, very colonial uh, forms that we inherit and we reproduce again and again, and twisting it to the people, twisting it to the moment that they encounter and making it even much more rich, much more imaginative, much more interesting. Because the moment where an audience encounters an object or encounters an exhibition is fantastic. And it's so non-explore because at the end, you cannot call exploration to put a label or to just put an audio guide into your ear. Um, and, and exactly that enactment, that moment of, of potential um, paradoxical thinking, potential conflict, potential friendship, potential um, encounters of education, younger generations, their use of technology um, interests me a lot. So lately I've been thinking that, you know, nobody's going to make me director of any museum after saying that, but I would totally think that it would be fantastic to have the restaurants in the like in the rooms where you are exhibiting, but also some sort of a co-working because probably imagine we did that fantastic exhibition of Thomas Baile, one of the most beautiful exhibitions that I've done. And, but 
In the middle of those works by Thomas Bayle, you should be eating a sandwich and listening a little bit of loud music and talking to your friends. And in the next room, perhaps a co-working space with architects or people dealing with the space or perhaps a workshop with teenagers dealing with technology and, and questions of TikTok and all that. But inhabiting it would be fantastic. I think I know that there is security reasons, but it must be also ways of dying with the people as a, an artwork that honors your existence. So, you know, this is also some sort of um, public restitution. So, yes, I did learn a lot. And I must say that I think a lot about those days, even today, because um, questions accompany me still. And would that mean uh, choose to take the entire, let's say, genealogy and the entire meaning of art institutions and kinds of practices and put these practices to work and these institutions to work against themselves, to force them to redefine themselves, to rethink themselves in, in a, to an extent? Yeah, of course, they have been very linear. They uh, Let's put it that way. I think our artistic institutions, if they are something, they are binary. I think, and moving them towards a non-binary world would be uh, very beautiful. They are completely separating um, culture from the society. It's not that they are actually there for the sake of the social. They're actually there to produce so many barriers that right now many people, many communities, many collectives are denouncing. Of course they are denouncing it because it's true. Um, and, and they perceive it. It's not that people do not perceive that barrier. And they do fantastic work as well. But what I mean is that it would be amazing if they would have the funds and the means and the staff um, to experiment with simple ways of bonding. And, and um, I, don't th I don't think that it's not the willingness. It's also the definition of their mission. Now, when, I, when you are in the States, they always tell you that before you do something, you need to define the mission of your institution. It's a very Anglo way of thinking, but okay, then let's redefine the missions of our institutions. And I think that the mission, the ultimate mission, is that uh, people discover something that is definitely in them, which is called love for the arts. They do have it, believe me. And that's the matter. I'm from a small village of Spain. None of my family members could study higher education. And yet they think art and artists are a fantastic presence. So it has nothing to do uh, with that barrier of educated people versus non-educated. It has to do with the way we have been articulating and broadcasting the signals. And that, let, me, let me just move from there to uh, something I also found very interesting in your work that has to do with this uh, need to refuse taking, for, uh, taking things for granted. It's an thing, for example, about your collaboration with the Sao Paulo Biennial or the Museo del Valle or the del Valle in New York. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, this idea of problematizing and starting from zero, when instead of defining things, trying to see how things happen or what's, what's the potential of uh, different kinds of uh, artistic developments, uh, to what extent is this linked to, for example, your writing on alternative works and our world, sorry, and for example, oceanic thinking and, and this idea of thinking beyond existing, let's say, canonical normative uh, understandings of what thinking means. Yeah, I think that for me has been very important to listen how other communities define their interest and their thinking. For example, I've been exchanging a lot with a very great marine biologist and friend called Mara Hart. And in listening to her introducing the question on the crisis of fisheries, I've been understanding better certain communication issues with our audience. So sometimes through listening from another field, talking about life, I, I get an idea of how life could be thought differently, could be organized mentally differently. And then we kind of discover new, new ways of doing it through, through that exchange. So of course she was talking about yeah, overfishing and its dangers, but also how, they are, how her NGO was kind of addressing 
you know, the different problems with those that were super close to the problem. And we have not been that specific in culture sometimes. And that interests me. So, yeah, I extrapolate all the time. It's true. I think um, I'm very curious. And um, I still have the impression that I know so little that it's so important to just um, get as many as many testimonies, as many possibilities of knowing realities as I, because um, the question of the white cube does not interest me. The white cube is a cage, is a, is a shoebox, is a, is a something that, um, that um, you know, it's in itself not super fertile as a metaphor. So it, it would be much better to think about exhibiting in nature or exhibiting in the ocean. So, um, of course, you can answer, but this is impossible. You can't really not do a biennial in the ocean. But I would say, give it a try. Give it a try to combine these two ways of thinking. Um, the, the conservationist way of thinking, um, the preservationist way of thinking, and the artistic way of thinking, and then merge it in some sort of a format. And we may discover also new encounters there. Uh, which are not genealogically the audiences that are traditionally interested and formed by what our institutions have been doing. All sorts of institutions. When I'm also all the time talking about institutions, I'm not thinking about museums. I'm even thinking about universities, uh, hospitals, um, all kinds of institutions that shape our way of uh, relating to certain things, excluding some other things. So, yeah, I think that this kind of transimaginatory way of relating does interest me a lot. And uh, I'm thinking, for example, about your role in Dogmeta 13 as well in relation to this and how important it was to define, uh, to, to deal with the entire project with beyond a conceptualization of the project itself, beyond saying this project is about this or that. How will we see it was to collaborate with other uh, people and let's say, human and non-humans. Uh, in documenta? Yeah. Mm, How is it to explain that uh, or to negotiate that with, in relation to other people? No, documenta was a very, very beautiful thing that happens once in a lifetime, but you should aim to it in a way because I would never define it as a collaboration because I was turned into a let's say, plant, or I could also be turned into a koala. So that was the master, it was the master animal of documenta that was, um, or the master of the forest, that was uh, Caroline. And then it was all, all sort of creatures. And then that was not stable because uh, those roles could be rearranged. But let's say that we just create something that was symbiotic. So I was kind of, literally all the time with her, all the time. And then she was talking all the time, a lot, a lot of hours, talking about things. She knows so much. And then she had this, this necessity because of the context to explain and to explain it to me. And I was sometimes really saying nothing. And then I would say something. And then Caroline would say, but I have no idea what you mean. And then full hours later, she said, ah, 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 ah. I think that you meant, and everything was kind of a complete, you know, going from like symbiotic relation that we totally knew what we meant. And then we kind of performed in front of those that we wanted to be with us. So the community grow, but then it grow as, oh, we need, where, I don't know, where are the koalas? Uh, so where are the, so we were just forming that, that world of, of biodiversity, but it was not established in a contractual way, not even informally contractual way, not even a collaboration as, yes, Carlos, I would like to collaborate with you. No, we just would run into your studio. You would like see these two creatures exchanging in ways you don't understand. And at the end, the question was like, hey, are you in? And then you would say, mm, uh, mm, uh, yes, without not knowing. So it grew in, a, in that very kind of organic, and it worked. It could have not worked, but it did work. So, 
And could you recall, uh, could you recall any part of that document uh, where such, let's say, spontaneous or not spontaneous collaboration work better, uh, let's say? I must say that I, I could, not long ago I was looking through the notebooks again and first, yeah, no, I don't have any any better or worse. I thought that I could not, no single part of that document uh, could be erased. It would be a massacre. And um, yeah, I love every corner and every person I met through that process. And I remember the big, big majority um, of them. And I know that is uh, mutual because we still have an incredible relationship with so many. And, uh, and it created a mutuality. I don't remember a single conflict, for example, that had anything to do with, I want that space, this space is better or bigger or... So all those conflicts, I may perhaps have, you know, uh, make my memory more beautiful uh, through years, but I don't think so. I just don't remember uh, conflicts because the conversation was very intense. It was very intense about the ways of 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 the epi epistemologies of indigenous people, but also um, the epistemology of nature and and uh, and animals and non-humans. How many different people approach those questions from many different angles the poetic, the scientific, the artistic, the anthropological, um, the musical. So it was so complementary that every time that we put the people together, it starts adding and adding and, and working. So um, I, had, I had really a very symphonic memory of that, of that process that was very long. I think it's, uh, it was full four years of, uh, of work, so. <laughs> And what about the projects, for example, that you, you have commissioned? Uh, how do you work when you, when you have to commission a project, for example? And how is the process of uh, negotiating with the artists and collaborating with artists in a specific, let's say, when just an artist or a group of artists are involved? I don't know. That's my favorite part of the job is to, to just facilitate the process of an artist coming up with a new idea and being there and I am a spinner so I have a head that connects many things so I can sense that um, it kind of creates a context that artists like because I don't expect anything in particular uh, and that's genuine of me so I don't I don't really expect any particular outcome so I really want to approach it as if it's something that perhaps none of us did before and um, and in finding out, um, yeah, the communalities inside the work, but also repetitions, non-repetitions, possibilities of novelty, fields that you have never been, um, elements and materials that you have never been experienced with, all those is super enriching. So, yeah, I just spent, I must say, this is the best part of my life. I spent hours and hours in the week um, doing that still. So I just spent the last year in Zoom with a fantastic artist called Taloy Javini. We are about to open an exhibition with her in the ocean space in Venice, which is already installed. And it's a 22 channel sound uh, piece that is incredible and kind of translates the Pacific uh, and experience of uh, transmission in the Pacific um, to Venice. So yes, spending hours a week uh, talking about the piece, well, so it's marvelous. I think nothing compares to that. So, but it's the first time she did this type of uh, sonic installation and sonic piece. And it happens quite a lot that we manage to, to travel together through something that is new for both. That, um, yeah, and it produces a bond. It's like becoming friends, of course. I am interested in becoming friends because it's probably my favorite you know, I'm super boring in terms of I'm not exactly a party girl, but the question of friends is super interesting because it's a guarantee at least of a couple of good drinks and, and joy. So, yeah, I'm motivated. <laughs> and in relation to, in relation to Venice, now no, you mentioned Venice, uh, to what extent do you find, are you finding that uh, oceanic thinking is a good way also of... Uh, going through what art can do and what art, going through how art 
can be part of a broader ecology, let's say, and redefining artistic ecologies as well. Why the oceans? In that? I think it's, uh, it's really amazing how receptive people are and also younger generations of artists and practitioners of different kinds. They really want they really want an experience of it and it's much difficult than one thinks. I think a couple of years ago, I, I knew so little. I think I am from the ocean, from a village that is really right on the coast. Generations and generations of people are my so-called ancestors also in the, I knew nothing of it. So, um, and I do think that people want to fill the gap with an experience that then breaches and possibilitates them um, to connect with other realities and interests that they have taken that one into account. So yes, um, it, it plays even a much bigger role than I thought because it's not about being interested in the ocean, it's that the experience of that close relation makes people, it, it, it creates a bond of trust in between us and the ocean or in between us and the climate question. So it's not, only a normative, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't act in such a way, but it becomes something that is part of your life and, and you can explain it. So after seeing those projects and exhibitions in the oceans, I remember, for example, John Jonas, or I remember uh, last February in the Museo del Prado, a performance where John Jonas was dancing the ocean. It has been done by for the ocean space with uh, was a commission by TVA 21 Academy. And I remember the people crying in Museo del Prado. So it was a moment of incredible, intense, beautiful emotion of, of, of connecting and feeling it. So after that moment, what comes is, ah, you cannot believe it. I was in that performance, you know, that I, I don't know what it was, but oh fuck, this is so beautiful. And you can see that lady and that old lady like dancing with fishes and so on and woof. And then you come home and Paquito, I need to tell you something that I've been in Museo del Prado. And so, so it's part of your, your new thing. Then you can tell it to the kids. Then also the kid comes with whatever exercise from the school and then you're I but you cannot imagine what I saw. I need to tell you. So that replication of the experience and it gets reintegrated into the oral history of our groups and communities, fundamental. So that's kind of the major role. It's not about you perceiving the ocean and saying, oh, yes, yes, it's so important that also artists help the ocean because it's not about that moral law. It's about much more than that, yet also that, but much more than that. And could I, just, just, to, just to conclude, could I ask you about your ongoing work in Basel, in Switzerland? Um, about my own work? Yeah. About what I do for a living? Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> ah, I run the art school. I'm very happy. So, no, I, I love it here. I think I kind of, I'm discovering that I'm actually running an art institute as I would run my ideal exhibition institution. So, the way I am activating the public sphere, the fact that we really managed to have a couple of formats that people are following, like our Women in the Arts uh, programs and symposiums where we are uh, dealing with questions of um, gender, but also questions of nature, questions of race, how we try to, to, yeah, to generate a different qualitative space of encountering between artists and those that are non-artists but are interested um, it's um, it's really, really very rewarding. And of course, we also do mistakes, but the try and the trying is so important. So in, in, in yeah, producing a different atmosphere for studying and being surrounded by, by a team of teachers and almost 100 and something students of art, it's a very, very privileged environment. Uh, we know each other, we care for each other. And I think that, um, yeah, it's given me really opportunities to explore things and possibilities in fantastic ways. Like my writing became different and better 
thanks to my students because I needed to talk to them and I needed to think through them. I needed to understand their minds. I needed to understand how they act and, and also organize things differently than, than myself and others and how to respect that and care for their way of doing things and reprogramming the system so that they feel um, we are doing things for them. So yeah, it's super, it's super great. So thank you so, so much for everything. It was great. And uh, I hope we can continue the conversation on the 15th of April. And I have yeah. more questions, but I want to keep some for, for, the, for the next month. Sí. So it's been a pleasure. And uh, let's uh, keep the conversation going. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Perfecto. Muchísimas gracias. Welcome back. Uh, Thank you so much, Chus, for, for being here again with us. Uh, and thank you, uh, to everybody who, who attended. Apologies for the sound, for the issues with the sound. Uh, Chus, I wanted to ask you something that came to my mind after the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in our conversation, you mentioned uh, issues of sharing, caring, uh, sharing with others, caring about others and doing and thinking in <clears throat> collaboration and partnership with many uh, beings from, from many different places. How uh, do you find the present conditions, the last, let's say, your work within the last year or so uh, have been affected? Um, which kind of, what kind of possibilities and limitations have appeared uh, in how we are connected in different ways in relation to that? Mm. Well, Thank you so much for being there. <laughs> it has been hard to yeah to listen to my voice. I'm like oh god, I'm like the Bonnie Taylor of curating, and um, yeah, it, I think the limitations we all know. I think these uh, restrictions of uh, interact yeah interacting only through Zoom, not being able to be today with you, having a drink after this talk, uh, talk a little bit more informally like take a walk perhaps into the garden. Um, that's for sure. But on the other hand, it also has given me an opportunity to explore possibilities and also to, to see if I am as generous as I'm saying. So um, I really have tried very hard to put a system of uh, connectivity among students and myself and teachers and myself and try to be there for everyone as much as I could and um, also connecting with um, other platforms that otherwise it would be difficult to connect because they are far away. I'm talking mostly about um, universities in Latin America, communities in Central America, and also in Spain and the south of Europe, and just offering what we have. Like the first thing I started to do is that we had materials and we had possibilities and perhaps they didn't have time to for example, during the first lockdown, many teachers and many people have been surprised and it was almost no content to share because everything was online, but you did not really prepare for the situation. So we start just um, sharing a lot as much as, as we could. I, I created uh, something that is called weekly packages. So every Monday we send, I think the weekly package is something for those that you have not been in Cuba. In, um, in Cuba, uh, where there is incredible restrictions to access media content, uh, the government distributes uh, even Hollywood premiere films and uh, TV series, music and books in a USB stick. And those uh, packages go uh, in every neighborhood. And, um, and I must say that the, some of them are absolutely amazing. So I thought I'm gonna do the same. So I'm gonna do this weekly package full with uh, kind of curated content. So offering you some movies, uh, like artist movies, some text, uh, some, some voice, and so on and so forth. So we start sending it every Monday uh, to, to all our students. And uh, we realized that they were very thankful because it's uh, some sort of, uh, like, it's really like a package. So you open and decide, OK, uh, you know, because of the pandemic, we thought that this movie is going to be amazing. Uh, put uh, please uh, loudspeaker and and watch it in such a such a way and so on and so forth. We're also doing some group uh, situations, so we end up sharing all this material, 
and um, and and then sharing it to many 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 people and uh, yeah it, it has also a time it has been a time of connecting also my students that normally are not so aware of the conditions of other schools became really aware of it and it has not necessarily been a bad thing to see that uh, the conditions are so different and the ways of connecting made a difference if you feel that somebody's there for you that you can send an email and gets answered in an hour or if you send an email and never gets answered so um, in that sense it has been an active methodological connection time so um, yeah I would describe it as such thanks so much uh, you made me think about uh, the, these packages this USB packages also include the critical theory so they were very useful tool for so we, we just put everything i think at the beginning uh, uh, like now like the first tranche was a lot since everyone was uh, watching much of content we were like adding so um dina dina dancing so how to dance alone so we were doing uh, alone dancing programs um, and then connecting it with uh, some old radio programs and scripts like for example ben Walter benjamin did a fantastic uh, radio program so connecting it with all material like kind of not only contemporary let's say digital material but trying to put you in another place and time because you needed it you were completely into your own bubble in the second one now um, we move into the how to that we tried to avoid because everyone in the first tranche of the crisis everyone was talking about how to bake how to do this and how to self-care and now we are into it. So we are like giving advice of practical things for artists. So this is, of course, uh, artistic practice advice, like how to document your work much better now that you have time. So what do you have at home? You have this type of camera, you have this type of software, you don't know how to operate both. So uh, we were like this kind of how to do things just to try to um, orient people towards the practice and not only towards watching things online all the time. So. Thank you so much. Uh, Chris uh, has written a question here for you. Uh, Chris says, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Uh, I was interested in your notion of the greatest friends to an artist. How do you distinguish between the disconnection and the need to retain a sense of criticality, even distance towards <coughs> the artist's work? Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Well, I am famous for not wanting any distance. So I am actually, uh, you know, the whole document as a teen was a way of uh, critically dismantling critical theory. So I'm not a huge fan of critical theory. Therefore, um, the idea that a judgment comes after, after distance is a very beautiful, very uh, modern idea, but not necessarily the one that I would embrace as a practice. So. I really don't want to have any. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with with only bridging, merging, and um, and going into directions which are difficult to describe, but are not necessarily. Um, yeah, are not necessarily the 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 critical theory prototypes of understanding the distance in between the object and the critic, the artist and the critic and curator and so on. So, yeah, I am in the opposite spectrum. Uh, just Lola mentions here uh, and asks here whether it is possible to get access to the content of these packages. Uh, and also, she says, I'm also interested in hearing more uh, from Jus about her experiences and practice as a teacher. Where does she teach teaches, uh, and how does this relate to her own curatorial practice? Is there a connection among your ideals uh, and how uh, and the way in which you approach education? Yeah. Very nice question. I'm actually not a teacher. I don't consider myself a teacher. Everyone else in my program, they are artists and they teach and they have also experience in conveying artistic practice to artists. So I kind of operate like, like a curator. I, I love to think about new methods, new display platforms, new ways of doing things. And I am a fanatic of public interaction, so public engagement. So I am, this is my role there. So I put all these uh, ideas on the table and then we try to discuss how to, how to activate them. Um, but, um, but I am really not a classroom 
person that much. So I am present there, but sometimes I, I'm in charge of the symposiums, which are public events where we discuss uh, women in the arts, so questions of gender in the art system. And I am with Philippa Ramos in charge also of art and science, but I am, I, I act as a host. So I, I would not consider myself as a teacher. And I think that um, I try to do it a couple of times, but I would not say I'm great. So, but, but I enjoy the substance. I enjoy the context and being surrounded by people that really know how to do it. And just the packages we can share. I can send it to, to Carlos, for example, and then you, if the emails are there, I can, I can send uh, what we have been preparing. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, to Stone Creek mentions, uh, I love your essay, The Octopus in Love. Uh, I love it as well. <laughs> and you talk about the ideas about institutions as rainforest and octopus, and whether your ideas about these have changed since you wrote the essay. Mm, no, they got even more radical in the sense that I really realized that after that essay, I, 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 yeah, I discover that we need to get really free of that institutionalized world and that it would be even really with the ocean and this, these uh, ideas of working with, um, with scientists, but also in different contexts with artists, how nice it would be to occupy spaces that are not necessarily um, indicated, institutionally speaking, for art uh, and artists. How beautiful it would be to, to do, like just to name it in a very conventional way, a biennial in the forest or to activate some natural, but not only like a sculpture park or something like that, but to really activate it as a space where there is the, the merging of the substance of art and nature could be together. So yeah, it did change, but I think that it got developed in a way. So I see it even more clearly that it needs to be done and that this kind of white cubes um, had historical importance and relevance and, and function. But of course, this is not where I am now. Just can I ask you, uh, thank you so much. Can I ask you about, uh, you mentioned uh, care several times. To, your, to what extent do you think that within cultural institutions, for example, care is becoming more and more institutionalized and what can art do in order to de-institutionalize care? Well, I think it's true. There's always a danger. Everyone is asking, but isn't it that uh, it's a real danger if everyone is talking about it and misuse it? There is always a danger, but there is also, um, you know, better to take the risk and try in whatever form and learn from it than not doing it. And the only the only way of learning is actually to activate it, to put it in practice, which is very difficult. I think those institutions were there only to take care of objects, historically speaking, and to take care of uh, um, exhibitions, but not to take care of the people. And this has changed because now the people wants to be taking care inside certain um, uh, social spaces with the objects and they have the right to claim so because uh, the impoverishment of our social network and the way that that we have been ruled um, makes them feel that they need these uh, safe spaces they will not claim for it if they have a feeling that they had enough of it they don't so um, to activate every method uh, to put it at work, I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I think with the risks that we may face, if everyone, even the cynical risks, I think there is, of course, a cynicism into, into claiming that uh, you care or that you represent or so on and so forth. But, um, but even in its cynicism, it's naming already something that's necessary. So it's better than ignoring the whole question altogether and going back to old patriarchal patterns. And can you talk a bit about the, the impact that applying, for example, such approach to, to others and to work with others and think with others have had in specific moments of your, of your career? Can you think about any example where you can see yeah. this has had a positive impact, let's say? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because I think that many people, or some people, not many, but some people during this crisis started to understand some of my behaviors and writings of before better than ever. Um, and I've been before perceived as a little bit of a 
esoteric eccentric or something same things and not only what i'm saying or how i say certain things or express it in my writing but also how i behave socially so my insistence in working with friends you know i've been always in every institution i've been and i must say i am an institutional person i think i've never been a freelancer it's important also to perhaps say that um, I work always in institutions and I never behave as the institution wanted me to behave really much, insisting in, in, in creating systems of uh, friendships and every time like, you know, well, how can you do that? This is nepotism. It's like, no, no, I want to be really ultra nepotic so that it does not play a role anymore because you are working with people that you don't know, but since the goal, ultimate goal is to become friends with those people, then it's fine because then, but eventually it's going to be nepotic again because we start working under that um, goal. I really want that. Otherwise, it makes no sense. I would not work just with individuals for the sake of performing a task. Uh, there is enough other structures to do so. And I must say that now I, I became a couple of really interesting emails of people saying, um, I'm, I'm, I, think, I think that we got what you meant with this type of things and, and behavior. And um, yeah, but it, it also, of course, um, uh, produce misunderstandings or people thinking that perhaps, you know, you should be more ambitious and go for I don't know what. And then every time they're like, no, no, but I am really uh, right now working, for example, in an environment that I feel really, really, we are doing such a human difference. Like we reach a moment where the group of people working inside feels the same as I feel and, and it feels so right and it's so beautiful that it would be, you know, and yeah, it, it, I think it, it, as you said, it, play, it, it plays a role to the readability and how the art system uh, goes for the system and does not go for the people. But um, if many, many institutions would um, Im implement it in a way, it would be a different type of talk. Or for example, why, why do you want to go to an art school choose? Like you could have gone to an institution. Like, but it is an institution. Yeah, I mean, no, I know what I mean, but implying that there is a second rate, that the order of art education is a different and secondary order uh, in that pyramid. So it's interesting um, how all these hierarchical um, uh, ways of, of, yeah, operating affects and of course, yeah, perhaps the crisis render a couple of behaviors of mine in a different light, I hope. Thanks a million, Chus. Uh, one final question, very, very quickly. Uh, to what extent can this logic be implemented, let's say, from a bottom-up perspective? perspective? Uh, what happens when, for example, the, the top to bottom approach fails and then uh, the entire community beings uh, that are working together, thinking together, living together, tries to bring this change about? Yeah, it's difficult. Huh? Um, even if we are talking all day about it, and I, I wish we could do more difference. The fact is that um, many structures are still very resilient and uh, try to try like ways like the organizational logic of many aspects of our capitalist society, um, you know, recites this music, but is not really um, embodying it. And, um, and it's, it would be amazing because I, I, I do think that in the long run, it would be much more not only interesting, but productive, if you want, <laughs> even like culturally productive, not economically productive. But um, yeah, but but I see it. So for example, the other day I was talking to friends and analyzing contracts. So analyzing laws is as important as analyzing behaviors and words. So behaviors and words uh, are fundamental, but also taking into account the type and the nature of the contracts that we signed as cultural workers. And the, this, uh, this taking everything, every detail of our engagement into account is super important to produce a transformation. So it's not only about us changing the way we drink coffee together, we talk together, we, we curate together, work together, but also uh, modifying um, as much as we can, uh, types of uh, yeah, contractual behaviors and also structural behaviors that determine uh, to whom does somebody report and the type of uh, 
control that they want upon uh, certain things. So control uh, control systems and so on. So that's a very complex question, but but uh, yeah, I think you know, for example, in in some countries when somebody new comes, um, many members of the staff are, are there to decide if this person is there for them or not. But for example, in my own country, in Spain, no member of the staff is ever invited um, to a job interview of somebody that eventually uh, may be a, a team worker or eventually maybe their bosses. So I think things like that, everything needs to be taken into account from, from reading the law to contracts, to behaviors, to language everything. Thank you so, so much, Sus. Uh, I wish we can welcome you next time in court personally. Uh, so let's hope that this can happen soon. Uh, as all, our, our, all our events happen on, online, but uh, just to mention, well, thank you so, so much. And also uh, this series will continue on the 27th of May. Okay, so this will be the last session of this First block, we hope we can have a second block in semester one next academic year, but we will close this block in, on the 27th of May with the colleagues from one group from Jakarta. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Choose. I hope we can continue the conversation, uh, keep the conversation ongoing. Yeah, and thank you thanks. so much.